You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 100 of Retired Racehorse Radio on the Horse Radio Network, part of Equine Network, brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products and Cashel Company. Retired Racehorse Radio is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse. Brought to you in cooperation with the Retired Racehorse Project and New Vocations Racehorse Adoption Program. It's our 100th episode. We've made it. Mama, we made it. We are so thrilled to not only celebrate Retired Race First Radio's fourth birthday this February, but also celebrate our 100th episode today. To celebrate, we share with you our favorite interviews. Trust us, this is really hard. And we celebrate you for supporting us along on this journey. New Vocations' Winnie Morgan Nemeth joins us to bring us an adoptable horse of the week and share with you another training tip. So stay tuned. It's going to be a great episode. I can't wait. And they're off on Retired Racehorse Radio, the podcast that is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse. This is Joy Orr, Detroit, Michigan. And this is Kristen Kovach Bentley in Jamestown, New York. And you're listening to Retired Racehorse Radio. Kristen, it's our 100th episode. We made it. I we think made this it. is a little different for me because I was not obviously on for all 100 episodes. So I would like to raise a toast to you, Joy, who has oh. been here for all 100 episodes. That's so this sweet. But, you know, it's interesting. My dad called me to wish us a congratulations on our 100th, which was very nice. But he was asking about you because he's like, wait, don't you have a new girl on your show? I was like, well, she's not quite <laughs> new new anymore. She's I coming up like to a her- new girl. <laughs> uh, you're coming up to your one year now, which is a big accomplishment. Is We're getting closer to it, but you have kind of been a part of the show in a different way since we have the partnership with RRP. So you've kind of, kind of been here since the beginning as well. Yeah. I've been like host adjacent. I've been a guest a couple of times actually, which is really yeah. funny. So anyone who's gone back and listened to all the episodes or has been listening from the beginning is like, wait a minute, you are, <laughs> I do yeah. recognize your voice. So yeah, exactly. it's cool to be uh on the other side, I guess now sitting in the in the host chair. So I know you've been yeah, indoctrinated into the cult. Welcome. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. Now I'm a cult leader. So here we are. Here you, know, you are. Podcasts <laughs> are moving and shaping the the culture. So you know. But yeah, I am honored to have been invited to join you and and happy to still be here. So oh, well, I'm so glad you've been <laughs> but a part really. Of the team. Yeah, it's been yeah. great. I mean, really like kudos to you though, Joy, because like you had the idea for this and you hashed it out and made it work and got the sponsors and the co-hosts and the guests and the whole thing. Like, this is really like applause for joy. Like, Oh, I don't know how else to say it. Like, this is like, this is your baby. I'm so proud to be here with you. I I am very proud of how retired racehorse radio has grown. It's so much better than I initially thought. So for those who are new, I think I've shared it on previous episodes. I pitched this in 2018 to Glenn, who is the producer of horse radio network, now part of equine network. And, um, I pitched him in 2018. Cause I like going through so many struggles with my own horse. And I realized I probably wasn't alone in it. And I, it was going to be the thoroughbred 30, like a 30 minute podcast about like a training tip. And it has grown into so something so much bigger. Jamie Jennings, who is the host of horses in the morning. She started the show with me. She was brought on as my co-host at the time. She was going to compete in the makeover and unfortunately was not able to join us today. Her schedule's quite busy because she's retraining lots of thoroughbreds now with horse and hound rescue. But yeah, we we started it and we weren't really sure where it was going to go. And it's been four years and now a hundred episodes. And it's, it's just crazy. All the things that we've done. Let's do another hundred. Let's do another hundred, but you know, it's not, it's definitely not all me as much as I appreciate you giving me that applause. Um, (laughs) So much of it has been, you know, the support from our sponsors, like KPP has been with us since the beginning, like Karen's amazing and really saw the potential of the show and understood the importance of the message we wanted to bring. Cashflow company has joined on. We've had some others who've joined in the past. Um, So we couldn't have done it without them. And then obviously with RRP and new vocations, they were so excited when we pitched it to them and both have been huge integral parts of making the show what it is. And of course, like you are listeners, like, oh my gosh, you're the biggest part of it. We wouldn't even have a show if you weren't here. So Kristen, I know on social, like we went ahead and asked people if they wanted to share any like loving kudos or their favorite parts of the show. We 
you know, we would be happy to give them that shout out. We had a couple listeners who did send that in, which I absolutely love. And I know like you got a couple lists as well from people. Yeah. And it's been really, really nice to get, you know, I mean, obviously we welcome feedback at any time, you know, and we've got also gotten plenty of candid reviews along the way, Mm -hmm. which is great because that helps us, you know, always make sure that we're improving and, you know, giving you guys what you want to hear, um, you know, the guests you want to see. Well, I guess not see the guests you want to listen to because Mm -hmm. this is a podcast and not a TV show. Um, But it was really, really cool to just hear, you know, we wanted to know like, what were your favorite guests? What were your favorite segments? Um, Anything that stood out to you? And and we got some really cool feedback from people. So we've compiled some of it to share with you guys. Uh, From Carrie Garvey, she said, I love being tempted by all of the adoptable horses, uh, parentheses, same, and hearing about lovable thoroughbred antics and accomplishments. Um, so that was really cool. Thanks, Carrie. Yes, I also agree with Carrie. I it's like the best and worst parts of this job are seeing all these available horses. I'm like, someday I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but I, I've been holding it together so all of our listeners can have these lovely horses so far because I've wanted to snatch up many of them. Uh Jillian Stevens sent in, I love listening to the two of you. I own two Arabians, like also a big love of mine. So I personally loved your recent episode about Arabian racehorses. So she said, thank you guys, which I would love to do more after our interview with Jonathan. I definitely want to learn more about Arabian racehorses and, you know, kind of comparing them to the standard breads and thoroughbreds that we learn. I think there's a lot we can deep dive into there. Yeah. We need to find someone who's trained all three. Oh, if you know that trifecta person, stance. if you know that person, email us, connect them. <laughs> uh, Rebecca John, a woman after my own heart, writes, "I love all the episodes. Sorry, I can't just pick one. Thanks, that's, that's awesome. fair, and we're not upset about it. We love that." Um, our own Winnie Morgan Nemeth, and I know we're going to talk to her later today, but she says just great topics, which I really appreciate because I will say every episode that. I've put it together and like Kristen, since you come on board, you've really helped kind of narrate some of this path too. Is I feel like we really try to curate topics of interest and bring multiple disciplines and multiple sides and really try to show life on the track, off the track, all the varieties of things they can do. So we really do try hard to get as many topics of interest as possible. And are always looking yeah, for more. I mean- we're never going to run out because, you know, we'll, there's just, there's always going to be something going on, you know, there's the racing something. industry and the aftercare industry. But yeah, I mean, you know, hearing that people appreciate the way that we curate these topics is good to hear. So thanks guys for that. Uh, Instagram handle X racehorse life coach, which is a great handle by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, also loved realizing I'm not the only one who has seen some of the training and hoof issues. So yeah, don't worry. You found your people here. You found a safe place to be for sure. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. It's fine. Uh, Rochelle Martel shared with us. You guys have re-sparked my passion for learning and helped me with my OTTB journey. And like that almost made me cry because that's what I wanted this show to be about is people who maybe have felt it's hard. It's hard training a racehorse. If you haven't done it several times, like for me, it was a very big learning curve. Um, and I was lucky to have support, but there are days where it does not go well and you're crying, you're questioning everything about your life, which I know in our limited horse panel, you and I were very candid about our fear of breaking our horses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, it's it's a real thing. So yeah, I, I love that Rochelle shared that with me because like, that's really what I wanted the show to be for is there was community and support and you felt inspired to go work with your horse. <laughs> Yeah. And it's, you know, I mean, it's helped you and I too, to talk Mm -hmm. to each other and talk to guests. And yeah, so it's uh, a little bit selfish that way too, but that's okay. Everyone's on the same journey. So, (laughs) Um, and I'm going to add one more to this list. Uh, This isn't specifically a listener feedback on the show, but I wanted to give a little shout out to listener Angie Summers, who has been a longtime listener of the show. uh, And for a long time has been responding to you know, all of our social media stuff and and leaving comments about the episodes and saying, I can't wait until I can get my first racehorse so I can really be, you know, part of the club. And she did. So congratulations, Angie. She got her first retired racehorse recently. Um, and conveniently, <laughs> it was one that we've featured. So standard bread King Hill. Yeah. So oh, yeah, King Hill, Angie. we featured him. 
back in 2022 and Angie has adopted him. So congratulations, Angie. And yeah, welcome to the Cool Kids Club with the Retired Racehorses. Congrats, Angie. And yes, give us an update of how he's doing. Like, that's amazing. I love hearing when people have adopted a horse we featured. It really warms my heart, really, because I feel like we were a part of it. Right. Yeah. Even if, uh, even if it wasn't us, we're going to take, even if it wasn't, you don't have to tell us if it wasn't (laughs) just, you know, Angie. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I love it. Well, this is definitely going to be a kind of like mushy, lushy show of all the feel goods. Um, I'm very excited. We've never done a show like this before, but I love that we're kind of picking interviews that really stood out to us. And, you know, while they may be a replay for some listeners, I I really encourage you to listen back in and you might pick something up that you didn't hear before, but those who might not have heard it, it's a really good chance for you to kind of go back through our history and see why these interviews meant so much to us. And when I say it was hard to pick, it was really, really hard to pick. Yeah, but, I would imagine, especially for you, you had the entire oh, library. Oh, I like have a whole <laughs> list. Oh, it was so tough. It was like, there's really not one where I was like, wish we didn't do that. Like there's not a single episode in there where I could say that or even think yeah. about it. But before we dive into all of that, we're going to hear from our premier sponsor, Kentucky Performance Products, who has made this whole show possible since episode one. This Nutrition Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, the company that simplifies your search for research-proven nutritional supplements at kppusa.com. If you've ever had a horse with diarrhea, you know what a frustrating problem it can be. Finding an ingredient that works to dry up the diarrhea becomes a high priority. It turns out that researchers have found one, a yeast called Saccharomyces boulardii. It has been proven to improve and halt episodes of diarrhea. It supplies specific nutrients to the lining of the small and large intestines, and these nutrients promote healing of irritated tissues. It also supports improved starch and sugar digestion in the small intestine, reducing the opportunity for imbalances to occur in the hindgut. Nalox Advanced, made by Kentucky Performance Products, contains Saccharomyces boulardii, along with a blend of fermentation solubles and stomach buffers. Nalox Advanced is recommended for horses of any age that are suffering from diarrhea. It also supports a healthy digestive tract in horses at risk for gastric or colonic ulcers, such as performance horses or any horse that is constantly on the go and exposed to stressful situations. For best results, Nalox Advanced should be fed on a daily basis. This Nutritional Minute has been brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of their terrific products at kppusa.com. So, Joy, for this episode, of course, we've decided to pull our favorite interviews. And you had 100, well, 99 episodes to look back on. So how on earth did you pick one favorite? It was really hard. And I have listened to a lot of our past interviews, which is a very nice, like nostalgic moment for me to look back and also realize how much better I've gotten at podcasting, like not to toot my own horn, but woof, nothing was going to come from the first five episodes, like (laughs) listening to myself. (laughs) Although still very good interviews in there too, would still recommend, but it, it was tough. Like I definitely narrowed it down to like my top four, which it was tough to do that too. So One, like easily hands down, I think it's one of our most popular episodes to date was in episode 58, we got to talk to the real Jan Vokes, who her horse was the inspiration for the movie that came out last year, Dream Horse. Um, So it was great to hear, like, she really had the dream horse, like where we just breed this backyard horse and ends up being like a champion resource someday. (laughs) Everyone's Uh, dream. Yeah. She lived the actual like girl in a horse movie life. Um, But her interview was definitely up there for me. One that really stood out too is in episode 56. We had the Indian relay races with Alonzo Kobe. I did a lot of like background research with him too, just learning how much they appreciate their horses, that they have that forever home and how they're treasured. And it really is like America's actual horse racing. Like we've adopted the sport of horse racing from England and all of that, but their their method to me is like the real American and yeah, come at me if you want, but it's true. 
it, it's been here since before colonists. And, and listeners um, like that one too, actually. I remember seeing some yeah. comments on social media that the listeners really like that Indian relay race episode. It was, it was one of my favorites for sure. And then, um, this one's emotionally tough. So, uh, episode 38, we had interviewed Anna Musi who works with a group, well, worked with a group called Rhino Revolution. And, um, that was such a fun interview as well. And she had brought over to their program X-Race Horses to help with their anti-poaching mounted patrol, um, saving rhinos basically. And uh, unfortunately, Anna had passed away last year in June, 2022 in a car accident, but her legacy still lives on at Rhino Revolution. They're still using those racehorses today. Uh, So she will, sorry, I'm not trying to get emotional, but she was just such an inspiration and a big part of our show too. And um, yeah, so it was tough to go through those interviews. But the one I ended up picking was from Christoph Hess. It was episode 54. And Christoph talked about initially about retraining thoroughbreds for dressage, but I really think he honed in on the attitude and like the mindset you need to come in when retraining horses off the track and really the importance of knowing they're training on the track and helping them to start translating what you want. So really building that communication channel with your horse. And when I thought back to what I wanted this episode to be about, it's like, well, this is really what our show was meant to be of how can you better communicate with your horse? How can you have that partnership with your horse? And I really think Christoph did a great job describing that. So for those who have listened, I encourage you to listen again and see if there's something new that you pick up. And for those who haven't, like, I hope you really enjoy it because Christoph was such a delight and you can tell how much he cares about the relationship between horse and rider. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Christoph Hess from episode 54. If you follow the world of dressage, you're going to know the name Christoph Hess. Christoph is an FEI judge in both dressage and eventing and was awarded the title of professional riding instructor by the German National Federation. He has spent almost 40 years working for the German Equestrian Federation and spent much of his life in the development of riders, horses, judges, and trainers. While Christoph is an international expert and educator of professionals, he is also a successful published author of several books, videos, and articles. He is joining us today to discuss his viewpoint on training a racehorse to do dressage and eventing as well as classical based on an article published in Practical Horsemen. Welcome to the show, Christoph. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for the invitation. I'd be happy being part of this program, which you have here in, in America and I think abroad as well. We're so glad to have you on the show, Christoph. I'm personally fangirling a little bit right now, so you'll have to excuse me. But I love reading your articles, and you have so much knowledge that you offer to us. And recently, I found an article on Practical Horsemen where you were answering some questions about bringing a racehorse from the track to the world of dressage. And you described this process as transforming the thoroughbred, which I loved. I couldn't think of a better way to describe the process. So how would you describe the right personality for a rider to bring a horse through this transformation. In my book named, he has a book called uh, Ride Better with Christoph Hess. I had uh, tried to explain in general that uh, when you train horses, you have to be a person who has a lot of patience and passion. But patience is very important, especially when you are training race horses. Why? Race horses are trained in the very beginning when they are very young, one and a half years, they start their career on the racing track. And normally they are trained not in the classical way as a massage horse or a show jumper eventing horse. No, they are trained to be the best, to be the fastest. And this means that the jockeys and the trainers try to stimulate the flight instinct of the horse. And this is what we don't want our horses when they, they otherwise they would run away always out of the arena so therefore we have to start a retraining program and it's with humans as well when we are in the beginning of our lives have a bad um, situation then it's Mm -hmm. really difficult to come back into the normal life and that's a little bit with horses as well i don't say that race horses are trained in a wrong way but they are trained in a special way dressage horses are in a special way show jump a special way but when you want to get a dressage horse sorry to produce a dressage horse coming from the racetrack then you have a special challenge difficult and the rider has to have a lot of passion 
and patient, very much patient, at a well-balanced and supple position in the saddle. That's important for him. When he is unable, uh, or he has to be able to ride without his reins. If he needs the reins to find his balance, the race hard would run. But if he's able to sit properly, to ride independent from his reins or her reins, then he is the right person to do it. I think it's not possible to do it without a trainer, an instructor, a coach from the ground. But um, nevertheless, if he had these skills, which I just had described, then it will be possible. That is such a beautiful way to say that. I have never heard someone describe racehorses as being trained to engage and frankly rewarded for their flight instinct. And it makes absolute sense when you see them on the track. And it's the opposite for dressage horses or really any other pleasure riding horse. You're taking them from one world and flipping them upside down and you have all these expectations. No wonder that they take a little bit longer than other horses to bring up. You describe the OTTB as a real character test for riders and trainers. And it makes sense. It does take a lot of patience, love and understanding to do this well and correctly. You also mentioned that in the article that OTTBs are really focused horses by nature, which makes them great at racing and competition. How can a trainer take advantage of this mindset during their retraining to get the most out of their horse? First of all, and I had studied in the old days pedagogics, and you have always to realize where a human, a young person, a man, a woman is coming from. And it's a similar situation for a horse as well. You have to realize where the horse is coming from. And it's not possible to say, okay, yesterday in the stable where the trainers train the horses to be as fast as possible to win the, the, the Kentucky Derby. And the next day you go to uh, Chef Peters, to Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, to become an international dressage That's mm -hmm. not possible. Therefore, a person like um, uh, Stephen Peters, uh, as an example, he would say, okay, I have to start with the horse, where the horse is coming from. You have to start with shorter stirrups. You have to start with a rising trot and light seat uh, in Kenza or a two-point seat to give him the feeling that the horse is nearly on the racetrack. And then you come from riding more in um, large fields, more and more at the end of the day, uh, not as a very first day, but at the end of the day after a special period, the Sash Arena, 2060, mm -hmm or in a covered arena, same size, something like this. But that's the next step. And you don't know how many time or how many days and weeks and training sessions you need before you do it. You have to, and this is a skill which a rider has to have. You have to listen very carefully into the horse. You have mm -hmm. to understand, yeah, the, the horse's uh, mentality. Like, and the more you are able to understand the special mentality of the racehorse, which was in the old days on the racetrack and was competing in races, the more easy or more possible it will be for you as a rider or trainer to retrain the horse to this direction. But you have to do it in very small steps with a clear structure. And always, and this is for me, for all riders important, but especially for the riders who train former race horses, uh, you have to get a feeling for the horse, to think from the horse's point of view, not from your human's point of view. What's good for the horse? What loves the horse? And I have always to start with things which the horses love. And then from this point of view, I can ask at the end of the day for more challenging exercises and so on. That is one of the greatest answers I've ever heard from anyone on this show. I've never heard of anyone suggest to mimic a jockey stance at the beginning of training to create a sense of familiarity and comfortability for these horses, and then transitioning them into a more classical dressage seat or hunter seat or whatever route you choose to go into. No one has ever said that on this show, and I think that's brilliant advice. So, serious. Thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm probably going to start using that information myself for my horse. I think it works out well with their ability to focus in on the tasks that we ask of them and to just gradually transition them. Do you feel it's more difficult to bring a hotter, more sensitive horse into the dressage world from the track rather than a more naturally relaxed horse or calmer horse? And 
do these methods work regardless of the horse's personality? What are your thoughts? When I'm watching these horses, at the end of the day, I can start with each horse for a retraining. That's mm. that's the first thing. But I think the horse is relaxed by himself or herself. The more the horse has a little bit a swinging attitude in the body, is able to use the back so that the horse has in trot and walk a little bit more moment of, as we say, suspension. And the more the horse is able to come into a good concentration, these skills will help a lot. But at the end of the day, I would say each horse is uh, trainable and I'm always very happy. And this was the reason why I had written this article that all horses should get a chance for a retraining and not just to finish and to send them uh, to the slaughter when they are not quick enough. So therefore, I'm very happy when I see the situation that horses retrained and a lot. And you said that I was an international eventing and dressage and I know so many horses, especially in the eventing world, in their first life came from, uh, from the racetrack. And they are very often very successful as eventers later. On, and these riders had to do a huge job with these talented horses to bring them into the new discipline in Absolutely. our big horse industry. Absolutely. Oh, I love that you said that. And it's been remarkable to see a lot of these horses make it, even up to the Olympics, yeah. Yeah. when they might not have been the best racers, but they have a lot of heart and a lot of go. And I think you described too that thoroughbreds enjoy learning. They absolutely love being students. They love taking in yeah, new information. Absolutely. How can a trainer use that as well? What tips or strategies do you have in a training program to tap into that sponge brain that they want to learn and please? Mm. I think what is very special what they have to learn, and this is, I would say, not maybe from the very first minute, but from one of the first minutes, they have to learn it. And the thoroughbreds had to be uh, ridden with a rider who is using longer stirrups. And then the horse has to learn to accept the rider's legs. And this is for me very important that a horse is learning this very early. And when you ask which exercises, which methods I am using, I am using with all horses, but especially with these thoroughbred horses, these race horses. And I had often race horses or former race horses and lots of thoroughbred horses because I'm judge and trainer and coach in one person. And uh, therefore, especially when I'm training eventing horses, I know that's for thoroughbreds in general, and especially for ra former race horses. It's for them a true challenge to accept the rider's legs. And this is what they have to learn, to accept the rider's legs. And therefore, in the beginning, they have to realize when the rider is coming with a leg, uh, that they move forward without running away, that's step one. And step two is that they learn to use the rider's legs to go sideways. Okay. We call it leg yielding, or later on, it's a lateral work, shoulder in, half passes, travier and ranvier. But in the beginning, that's for me more important than lateral work. In the beginning, leg yielding in all variations, uh, which we have in the dressage world, this is for me very important. And my experience is that a horse which is well trained in leg yielding is a horse which is on a good way and is a huge step forward looking from the racehorse's first life. Mm. So therefore, I'm always happy when they start with leg yielding first in walk, later on in trot, and all riders will answer, oh, now it's convenient. Now I have a good feeling in the saddle because my former racehorse is accepting my leg. And the mm. more, and this is, I think, something which is important for your uh, listeners. Important is that all horses, but especially the racehorses, especially the, the, the thoroughbred horses, have to accept the legs because these horses are 
running horses. They want to move. And many riders think, okay, a horse is running. I have to stop with my fingers or with my hands. And that's the first step into a total wrong direction. And when I did say in the beginning, racehorses, animals with a very much trained flight instinct, I'm mm. now saying we have now to train them that the flight instinct is not has not the majority mm -hmm. in the instincts of the horse. We need a horse which is now accepting more and more uh, the rider with his car, with his position in the saddle to, to ride everything independent from the reins with the position in the saddle. And he is he or she and he are sitting, but is sitting in the saddle and is not like a jockey just sitting on top of the horse. No, they, they have to come into the horse's movement and mm -hmm. have to ride the horse more and more in front of the driving aids, as we say, independent from the reins. And when the horses realize that they are ridden independent from the reins, then they start to relax. Then they start to be more and more supple. Then they start to seek a bit to come into the right contact, find the right connection. This is important. And then at the end of the day, they learn to move in a good way, looking from the biomechanic point of view under the saddle. That's for me the secret of retraining or training a former racehorse into the direction of, yeah, of, of dressage or Beautiful. eventing dressage. No? Beautiful. That Oh, I, I can see why you have many best-selling books. You're so eloquent in how you describe it. And I can visualize, I'm like thinking with my own thoroughbred, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try yeah. some of these things later today. You're very honest with the timeline it takes to retrain these horses. It's not an overnight fix. It's not a 30-day no. quick train that Americans like yeah. to boast about. Yeah. It, you say it takes about a year to see the true transformation. Yeah. What expectation, like when we think about the levels of dressage, what should the actual expectation be of these trainers after that one year if they put in the work diligently? Yeah, it depends a little bit who is doing it how consistently he or she is doing it, and yeah, what's the goal of them. Um, I think uh, after one year, if you're able to ride proper walk, trot, and canter on curved lines, big circles, on a volte, and a uh, whole arena, and being able to lengthen the steps, to lengthen the strides, to do a lot of transitions between trot and canter, when you are able to do this, Then you did a huge step forward on both hands. Horse is not running away and the horse is really well relaxed. And I'm looking very carefully to the scale of training, the pyramid mm. of training. Um, the first is the rhythm, very close connected with tempo. This has to be good. Then relaxation or suppleness. And the third point is the connection or the contact. When we have these three things under our control or these three um, important steps looking from the pyramid points of view of training, then I'm happy that you are doing this. And then when you have this really under control, then you can develop special exercises on first level, second level. I think between first and second level you are. that. But the movements, the special exercises are very small. Only maybe of your work, uh, maybe 10%. 80 to 90 percent, you have to do this, what I'm just explaining. And when you have this under control in a nice way, and then you will have a supple horse, a horse with a good cooperation, and then you can come quite easy from um, first, second level to third level after maybe a year or more. This can work. But it's very difficult and I was uh, for many years responsible for the principles of riding which we published in Germany and we were discussing it in the group. It was not my, I'm, I was not the only person who had written it, uh, but I was part of this uh, working group to produce these principles. And we were often thinking, do we write something, how much time we need for step one, step two, step three, and so on. And at the end of the day, we said, no, we, we don't do it. Why? Because we think each horse Each horse and rider combination has their own timing. Therefore, it's very difficult to say after one year, you have to be on this level and one year, 
more you have on this level. This is very difficult to, to say, especially when the horses are coming from the racetrack. Some three years old, some eight years old. That's a big difference. Some have an injury or a head had an injury. Some has no injuries. Some trained in a very horse-friendly way. Some are trained in a not-so-horse-friendly way. And then, very important, how is the facility where the horse is coming and who is the rider and who is the trainer? How often are you training the horse? Is this a trainer with a lot of patience or is an aggressive rider? Also, a thoroughbred and an aggressive rider, no chance. You need really passion and you have to be a true horse friend. Otherwise, it will not work. That's for me very important. But therefore, I think uh, to give a short to, uh, answer to your question, I think uh, between first and second level. Beautiful. And I think it is important that you mentioned a lot of focus on the scale of training as yes. opposed to necessarily moving through training, first yeah. level, second level, yeah. Yeah. removing that element of competition and just focusing on the foundations yeah. of the horses. Yeah. Top notch. Well, Christoph, thank you so much. I have one final question because all of our yeah. listeners are going to want to know if I were to take you down to any of the racetracks today for you to pick out a horse on our dollar, what would you look for in your next dressage companion? Who would that be? And what does their body type look like? Yeah, it's a quite interesting question. Either I saw uh, in the internet and in Facebook uh, a lovely from Cheltenham uh, William Foxbit, he's a brilliant international Olympic eventing rider and medal winner, very famous, one of the most famous uh, riders in the world from Britain. And uh, his wife is very much involved in the racing world. And she posted a sermon. I would say, and it was a lovely horse, and I had written under it, the horse has lovely movements. I would love to train this horse because she had a, a short uh, video clip and I could see the horse, and this horse was swinging. I think many horses on the racetrack, they just trot like, uh, like boop, 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 boop. and these horses to train, to start to swing more, to use mm -hmm. more the back, to start more swinging over the back, to become a proper back mover. That's a real challenge for them. And therefore, I am looking very much to the potential of swinging. This horse was a lovely back mover and i look to a back mover and i look very careful into the horse's eyes i look very careful is this a horse with looking very much having the flight instinct or is it more a horse which is trainable because the horse looks quite relaxed is it a mm -hmm. horse which when you handle it properly will be a relaxed horse, a horse which will give you the feeling of cooperation because this makes life much more easy when you have mm -hmm. a horse which wants to do the job and is not fighting against you. Mm -hmm. Cooperation is a very high skill, but a very important skill to train horses and humans as well, the cooperation. So this is what I'm looking for. And I look very careful to the body language of the horse. How is he looking around like this, always a little bit afraid? Or is it a horse which is re mentally and physically really relaxed and is doing uh, yeah, th this in a nice way, though, relaxed and this is for me important. Therefore, I look very careful into the eyes of the horse. I look to the ears of the horse. I look how is the skin? Is the horse wet or is the horse relaxed? So, mm. And how is the horse in walk? Is it in walk like this or with long steps in the walk? This is something I'm looking for. And um, when the horse gives me the feeling, okay, I'm trainable, then I think, that's a horse which I use. It's a little bit of feeling, a uh, mm -hmm. thing for the feeling. There we have some criteria I can explain, but at the end of the day, it's a little bit the, that I say, okay, my feeling is this horse could be a nice dressage horse in the future. Beautiful. Or Eventa, <laughs> maybe Eventa of more, mm -hmm. because they are fast cross country. They love to run. They love mm -hmm. to jump. They are brave. And they are fast at the end of the day. Thank you so much, Christoph, for your time today. It was such a pleasure. If people want to learn more about you or reach out for maybe some of your clinics, where can they find you? 
Also, I can be fine with I have a homepage. Also, www.christoph-hess, also Christoph, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H, and then dash H-E-S-S dot info. And I have a homepage. And whenever you like, you can ask and I can give you my phone number if you like, because I'm easy to get via WhatsApp as an example. And I'm in Facebook as well. Messenger is possible. And my phone number is plus 49 for Germany. And then 170 and then 85193223, which is my mobile. And I'm I think I'm quite easy to get and you can send me or someone else can send me a voice message or a text, a chat. And yeah, WhatsApp works very well and I use it a lot. Or send an email and I have an email address ch at christoph-hess.info. Thank you so much, Christoph. I appreciate it so much today. We'll make sure to have all those links in our show notes. And thank you again for your time. It was such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Enjoy the day. And please stay healthy. Ah, and same to you. <laughs> I hope we will have a lot of competitions this year. Well, I'm here with Tony from Cashel. You all know it from the ads you hear all the time on this show. But I, we're at the trade show, and this is the p- point of time in the year where we find out what's new coming out. So what's Cashel have new coming out? Oh, we've got a, a great lineup of uh, 32, 34 wool top pads. So uh, t- describe them. Uh, five different colors, real vibrant, bright, sharp-looking pads. What are the, what makes them different? Uh, well, it's the fill. The 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 wool felt on the inside is a natural felt, and the fleece on the bottom is a hundred percent merino. Oh, really? Okay. So th- these are soft and squishy pads. Well, not real squishy, but soft, and and they do absorb shock and and saddle fit. What would they retail for? What are those? That's you about know. 119. That's the right price. Yeah. Anything else new with Cashel coming out? Oh, we've got uh, more saddle pads coming in the fall. A uh, new strap line coming in the fall. It's uh, a two tone that looks great with a, a great buckle set on it. There's we're always in development, so there's so many things projects in the works. What's still your most popular product? Is it still always the same things year after year? Uh, fly, you bet. Yeah, fly, fly that's what we all. Is what, it. That's how I knew you in the first place was fly. Fly masks. Yep. Yeah, many years ago, uh, we were primarily fly masks and kind of had some tush cushions and a few odds and ends. Today, we've broadened that offering to saddlebags, uh, strap, head stalls, breast collars, bell boots, um, leg protection, and the it continues to grow. Is there a place where somebody can go and see all the products? Uh, Cashelcompany.com will give you a good offering. There you go. Well, thank you, Tony. It's been fun seeing you again. Hey, thank you. Good to see you. So, Kristen, we just listened to an interview with Christoph, but I'm curious, like you've been with us for almost a year now, so I know your selection was a little different. How did you pick and what did you pick? Yeah, yeah. I just went back to actually like, count. So my first episode was episode 75. um, And you really treated me well on that first episode. (laughs) Our interview was that panel with Donna Brothers and Diane Crump. So I was like, whoa, all right, we're in the big time here. We're like, you know, talking with the fun episode, big girls. So (laughs) (laughs) like the peak of the peak of, um, you know, female jockeys and, and awesome legacies. So, you know, it's been very timely for uh, women's month we have right now. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. So yeah, I was thinking like, yikes, man, how do I follow that up? And then, um, you know, kind of inspired by that first episode, I just sort of got to work like, you know, trying to hustle up guests and and sort of like see what narrative we were going to take with this podcast, you know, and I know you just mentioned, you know, when you were introducing the Christoph Hess segment, you know, that the impressions you really wanted people to get from this was, you know, progressing in your training with your horse and finding a better connection and, um, you know, really being successful with these race horses because they are such a challenge. Um, and I come at it in a little bit of a different angle, you know, still keeping that in mind, you know, that that's what the show ultimately is going to be. But, you know, I, from where I sit, having worked in thoroughbred aftercare now for, this will be my fifth year uh, with the Retired Racehorse Project, the conversations happening around the racing industry and the aftercare industry, I think are really, really critical. They're at a very important stage, you know, where we're really starting to 
push it a little further, you know, that aftercare is, is a cost of doing business, you know, for racing. It's not just this thing, you know, that we want to remember a few days a year and, and, you know, feel good about, but it's really like, it needs to be an important established thing, you know, and then the natural next step for these racehorses. And at least early on, I was really starting to take a little bit more of an aggressive stance with that. So an early guest I invited on was uh, Natalie Voss from Pollock Report, and she had just published um, that series about young people in racing. So if you haven't read that series, I definitely recommend going back to Pollock Report and reading that because it's a lot of commentary that she gathered from young folks in the horse racing industry in various aspects and, you know, how they felt about being a young person and what is essentially kind of an old white man sport. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's a really interesting read. And we had her on to talk about that series and then sort of, you know, push the envelope a little bit with some questions. And I just remember sitting there interviewing her and thinking like, this is really cool that I get to do this, you know, that, that we can sit and have these kind of important industry shaping conversations and like, this is my job now. So uh, yeah, to, to honor that sort of light bulb moment, that's why I selected this interview with Natalie Voss. It also helps that Natalie Voss has been on my like really cool people I want to hang out with list. Um, so <laughs> Natalie, if you're listening, call me. Um, but also, yeah, it was just a really neat introduction into like, we can sit down and have these conversations and people, people want to sit down and have them with us. Our next guest, I'm very excited to have on, someone whose work I have admired for a long time. We have Natalie Voss joining us. She's a three-time Eclipse award-winning writer and the editor-in-chief of Pollock Report. She writes about a variety of subjects, but specializes in horse care, legal, and investigative reporting. She's the permanent student of a semi-retired Pertron and Thoroughbred Cross mare and competed in last year's Thoroughbred Makeover with her very first OTTB underscore, known to all of his friends as Blueberry. Natalie, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So what caught our eye recently in Natalie's work um, is her Next Generation series that she published on Pollock Report uh, about a month ago, I think at this point, right, Natalie? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So the Next Generation series, if you guys haven't read it, uh, definitely worth looking into. It was a five-part series in which Natalie spoke with a huge variety of people in the racing industry, all you know, in the younger generation, so 20s and 30s, just coming up through the ranks in like a huge variety of positions. That was what struck me in reading that. Like there are so many jobs in the horse racing industry. How many different people did you speak to? Oh gosh, I'm not I'm not actually totally sure. I think I had maybe about 20 or 25 interviews altogether. Wow. I started running them on Monday and by the time we got to like Wednesday or so, I heard from people who'd read the series who I did not know or had not been referred to prior when I was like sort of scouting for interviews from people who said like I kind of fit in this age demographic roughly that you have here. Would you like me to answer the questions? This is the position that I'm in. This is like the, the job that I'm in. And I said yes to several people that I kind of added by the Friday edition. So it was, nice. I think I had roughly five in each. So 2025 by the end. Yeah. So it kind of like took on a life of its own then as it started going. Yeah, it really did, which was not something I had totally expected. I sort of thought out people where I'd had this conversation with them before of just like, how do we feel about this job choice that we've all made to be in this industry? And then said, like, I don't want to just keep this to people I know. Like, if you know someone else who you have conversations with or who you know has strong feelings about this, please refer this on to them so that I would widen the circle as much as I could. So I had some people I knew well and some people I didn't know at all. And that was made it really interesting to see the similarities between answers and the differences between answers. Yeah. And that's the key here is that it wasn't like the LinkedIn of the horse industry with like all these various jobs, but it was really like a, a commentary on the state of racing and where it's been and where it's going. And is there a place for our generation in this industry. And I think you've got such a wide range of answers overall. Like wh what's your take? Where is there a place for our generation in this industry? And are you hopeful or uh, distraught somewhere in the middle? Like how are you feeling now that you've gotten this experience? Well, I think first of all, there is a place for this generation in the industry as long as the industry keeps going and remains at a size where all of us can have jobs. A lot of people seem to think that some degree of contraction is inevitable 
in racing. And so I guess there's a place for us, but the question is how many of us, and we don't really know what that looks like. I don't think that everybody necessarily feels that way, but that's the sentiment that I've heard um, from people of all ages is that some kind of contraction is probably coming at some point in the next you know, decade or so. As to the sort of relative pessimism or optimism, I'm not a particularly optimistic person by nature. I tend to <laughs> sort of <laughs> approach things by like, how can I anticipate potential problems so that I can try to fix them or so that I can sidestep them or whatever? And so that probably translates over to my feelings about the general direction of racing too. But it's hard to do investigative journalism and feel really optimistic about racing right now, for sure, just due to the, the depth of potential topics there are. And a lot of them, as I think you had acknowledged to me at one point are, are not terribly uplifting things a lot of the time. So it's difficult for me. There were some people who kind of said what I had expected to hear a little more of, which is like, what did I do to myself by making my resume this niche that I'm so like entrenched in this one business that is not very big and it's not getting bigger to be particularly optimistic. But I was encouraged by how many people responded to that question set and did express some degree of hopefulness but a lot more people express kind of hopefulness that like you know there's a lot of things to be worried about but if we can turn this around if we can make some really good progress in welfare and safety and integrity surely this is a sport that can appeal to more people because there is a lot to like about it and i did find that very encouraging I love that, Natalie. And I think it's interesting that you said it was difficult to come in with some optimism. And I'm sure as a journalist, because you're seeing both sides, you're seeing the non-equestrian side of the media that takes one view that we've all seen. I mean, we can all think back to Santa Anita and the horrible tragedies that happened there. But you're also seeing the horse world of these educated people who know the ins and outs of the sport. And I, I read through all five sections of the series. And it's just absolutely brilliant and absolutely mind-blowing at the same time. But I was able to pick up on those trends of the optimism of these people are clearly passionate about what they do. They love what they do. They radiate what I would imagine most people say crazy horse girl or crazy horse guy energy in such a fashion of it's an obsession. It's a part of who they are as individuals. But they also bring up the same themes of We kind of have this old boys club and leadership, which, yeah, I stock the jockey club. Come at me. There is a lack of diversity there. I don't even see a diversity and inclusion plan for the jockey club. And was something I I would love to see. I'm going to throw that right out there. I'm going to get political. But, you know, there's this old boys club. There's a resistance to change. There's like a ceiling that people are seeing in their careers. And I have to ask, knowing this, what do you think is the most critical thing we need to see for change in the sport. And it's a heavy hitter at the beginning of an interview, but I think we'll find some other questions in that. (laughs) Yeah. I think that a lot of broader difficulties that the sport faces kind of come back to that same theme, Mm -hmm. which I think is, it doesn't get enough credit really. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the business of, having the same people in charge for so long. I mean, there's not a ton of people when you really think about it, who actually truly retire from this business. They Mm -hmm. continue on in some sort of role on some board or doing some sort of corporate thing where you're not totally sure what they're doing, but they, they're, they got a position, they're doing something, they control something. Well, past like normal (laughs) retirement ages. And I think that, a lot of the, especially public relations difficulties that we have in racing is not helped by that. I think that the younger generation has probably a better sense, some of them, not all of them, has probably a better sense of the world outside racing and how the world outside racing sees racing and interacts with racing. And there seems to be kind of a recurring theme in a lot of those interview responses from people who pointed out, that's really critical. Like we tend to forget that. We tend to forget how we come across to somebody besides each other because we just talk to each other all day long. But like that doesn't work anymore. The world is too integrated. Social media is too much of a thing 
you can't live in an isolated kind of mindset or an isolated sort of world anymore. And I think that the next generation understands that better than people who spent most of their career without that kind of same outside critique and outside pressure in that same social environment where animal welfare is more of a concern and people think about animals differently. I think all these things are kind of wrapping up into one. And I think that like, there would be some progress if people who understood the current issues a little bit differently and came at it from a different perspective were given the opportunity to be in roles where they could make an effective difference because that seems to be kind of you know part of that problem is that there are younger people in racing in entry level and in middle management and then you kind of stall out because there's somebody above you who's not ready to retire yet and so you're kind of mm-hmm. stuck where you're stuck until they're ready to hand the reins over. And so when I had written my commentary at the end of that, that was sort of my intent is that the the people I spoke gave me interviews on a condition of anonymity because they didn't want to suffer consequences for expressing opinions. And I thought, okay, then I was so terrible that that a lot of them wanted to, which was guys just let us try to help this whole thing. Let us try to help turn the ship around. And I felt like that was something that I could say that maybe some of them felt like they couldn't. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, it's cool that you were able to give even anonymously give this platform to these voices and hopefully bring attention to it. So I like what you said about outside perspectives, because you have a lot of people that are not these Kentucky blue bloods coming in because like us, they were all just crazy horse kids. And it's interesting because I did as you were speaking, I was thinking about like, this is not a way I saw this coming full circle, but I'm running our little family farms Facebook page. And recently was just featuring different members of our family, including those of us who married in, who were not born on the farm. And I'd like to think that our perspectives as outsiders who were not like growing up in ag is pretty valuable because we've had experiences elsewhere. So I just think that's really valuable too, to get these people coming in that have not, you know, grown up in the sport or or grown up in Kentucky even. One thing that I was thinking about, we were engaging in a little Twitter conversation when I run the Retired Resource Project's Twitter. So if someone had thrown out some discussion question, you know, of how do we get to engage more young people in the sport? Um, and I suggested like all these crazy horse kids were taking lessons on off-track thoroughbreds, like teach them about that horse mm-hmm. and teach them where that mm-hmm. horse came from, what his jockey club name was, you know, what he did on the track, where he ran. See, younger horses coming in, there's so much more information available about watching race replays and and get them hooked in that way. But, you know, I noticed too in those interviews you did, everyone is pretty strictly on the racing or breeding side. From the racing industry's perspective, is aftercare really considered part of the industry or are we sort of still a fringe, like part equestrian, part racing, sort of its own thing? Like where does that fall into this bigger umbrella? So I think that's kind of another area where I'm hoping that the next generation people in racing are going to be able to make a little bit of a difference. I think that, you know, it's varied, of course, like there are certain farms that are run by, you know, recognized family names that do a ton with aftercare and contribute to the 501c3 causes and do advocate that. But I think that the mentality for most of the established places, history has been that aftercare isn't really the same thing. It isn't really part of racing. Aftercare as a concept is relatively new. The word, I think, is really not even had common usage until I'm going to say maybe 15, 20 years ago, something mm-hmm. like that. So this is not something that the really established sort of people who've been around a long time have spent as much of their careers thinking about as what they sort of have to now. I think that they kind of think that is a thing that we need to do. That is a responsibility that we have. But then we find the horse someplace nice to go. We contribute some money to making sure the horse can find someplace nice to go. And then the horse is doing whatever it's doing. And it's not really you know, our thing anymore. And I think that's a mistake. They're purpose-bred animals. They're a breed that exists largely because the sport exists. They don't stop becoming that just because they're not doing the first job that they had anymore. And I think that it's underserving ourselves as an industry to not count their accomplishments as our accomplishments when they go off to another sport and achieve at a really high level as plenty of them do. 
I mean, a lot of them end up with adult Emmys like me who are just sort of struggling through a training level test. <laughs> but there are off-track courses that go and do amazing stuff at yeah, a variety of other disciplines. And I think that the more this interest in them grows, thanks to the makeover and just the general popularity of off-track courses, the more that's going to be true. And I think it would be a mistake for racing not to say like, hey, this is also part of us because we created the source that did this. And yeah, we had a different idea in mind, but we still produced an athletic animal. We still produced a relatively sound animal because it's obviously saying sound enough to do whatever job it's doing now. And those are wins for a breeder, for an owner, for a trainer who you know, kept that horse in condition through its first job. So I think that there isn't that... I can't say that there's not an adoption of it by racing because racing has been supportive of these things, but I don't think that they've been thinking about it as we're supporting this because this is also us. I think it's like we're supporting this because it's a nice thing to do and we should do it, but I don't see there being the crossover that there really should be. And as you observe, like there's a ton of potential fans of racing who are encountering the sport via off-track thoroughbreds. And there are a ton of people who would like to one day work in the industry possibly by introduce by you know first being introduced to an off track thoroughbred and then hopefully learning something about the world they came from you know there's this, this pipeline possibility here that mm-hmm. seems so easy but I don't think we're really doing enough to take advantage of. I'd say on either end, yeah, mm-hmm. racing mm-hmm. or equestrian, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that as well. I mean, I've been a part of not nearly to the degree that you have, Natalie, but different discussions and racehorse forums. And when they find out that I just do a podcast about aftercare, I get a ton of questions. It's clear like a lot of these people are, they know they donate to it. They know some of their horses have gone to programs. But other than that, they're not really in bridging the gap in between. So it's interesting that there is such such a large space in between the horse's career on the track and where they end after. And so I guess here's my question for you, because I know we're running out of time. I'd love to bring you back on though, because this is fabulous stuff to have. A lot of your interviewers or interviewees, I should say, they mentioned that there was a gap between like the public eye and public media of what's happening on the track in their lives and the aftercare of the horse afterwards. What would your recommendations be as like an average listener, an average supporter? How can they ask people within the industry who are making decisions? Like we want to see more represent or representation. We want to see more fair news articles about what's really going on with horse care and the sport. We want to see safety regulations. How can the average person get involved to make their voice heard? Maybe that's not a fair question to ask. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's a really tough one because like one thing that racing has always had difficulty understanding, I think, is that the interest of mainstream media is always going to be different from Mm -hmm. the interest of industry media. And that's always going to be different from public relations. So the mainstream tends to focus on what's easiest to understand for them. and a lot of the intricacies of a horse did this equestrian thing that your readers may or may not be familiar with. And now he's doing a different equestrian thing that your readers may or may not be familiar with. It's kind of a tough pitch uh, (laughs) to a reporter who, unless the reporter themselves has experience in that. And then, you know, you have kind of a shot at getting some interest, but it's sort of tough to tell that story on a broader scale. But we do have stories that are really incredible that I don't think get as much attention as they should as horses that find their way, you know, back to racing connections after they retired. I wrote a, a story about a horse like that a couple of years ago and the horses that really excelled at racing geldings, especially there were stakes geldings and then became really successful at something else. There, there are sort of stories that are easier to grasp. It's just kind of a fight to get a non-horse person to understand it. So I kind of think you're, better bet is to like get the equestrian community that's not part of the racing community on board yeah, to understand. Which that is, that it is an area better. that is divided and there's horse people yeah. who love racing and there's people who think it's barbaric. And I'm like, that's probably where we need to put yeah. the focus on. And truthfully, I don't know how to get my voice heard at a jockey club. I don't at that level. 
Yeah, I think that you're right that talking to people who already understand horses is probably the easier battle than trying to explain all of horsedom and then a particular like corner of it to someone who kind of doesn't know the front end from the back end of a horse, but they think they're really pretty and they want them to be okay. <laughs> you know, that's kind of, that's kind of in the, the premise of the mainstream media's interest probably. But yeah, I think that doing a better job of explaining ourselves to other equestrians is probably the better place to start. And then that also goes the other way though. Like you mentioned about there being racing connections who were kind of aware that they had a horse go on and do something else, but they're, mm-hmm level of knowledge about that maybe wasn't very good. When you think about it as an outsider watching dressage or watching hunter jumper or something like that, it's not that easy to figure out what's going on. Like, yeah. If they yeah you're like, it's they don't trotting. Know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. They're trotting yeah. real well. I don't know. There's definitely a two way kind of communication that probably needs to happen to improve that mm-hmm. engagement because like they're, just, the racing people are just as confused by the equestrians as yeah. the other way around. I'm sure they don't, um, under, don't I, understand why their bloodstock is doing a pee off in a sand lot. Like they don't understand that. No, <laughs> right. Yeah. Not, not at all. They, they, they know that this was, yeah. Like, especially at the lower levels, like honestly, it's, it's not that interesting to watch a lower, a lot of lower level stuff when you actually do the mm-hmm. thing, like let alone <laughs> right. somebody yeah. who has no idea what's going on. And it's just like, yeah, I see my horse. He's trotting. Like, cool. There's also something to be said which is probably an entirely different discussion for uh, this mentality that I think true throughout equestrian sport, which drives me crazy of like, yeah, there's, there's equestrians who look at racing and are like, Oh, that's terrible and barbaric, but my sport has no problems. And it's mm-hmm, like, no oh, guys, right. everybody's sport has some kind of problem. Like as equestrians generally racing or non-racing, we need to get better at this thing of like, no, no, welfare is important. No matter what you're doing with the horse, <laughs> right. nobody's mm-hmm. world is perfect. Nobody's sport is free of bad apples. Like, let's just yeah. drop that right Enough now. Enough finger pointing, <laughs> for sure. Out. Yeah. yeah, let's just Absolutely. try to understand each other and understand the best each other has to offer. It's just a different way to enjoy horses. Like, I enjoy loping along across my field looking for cows. Joy likes fancy prancing. Natalie, you like fancy prancing too and doing your dressage. And like other people like to own their horses and watch them race. And that is just how other people enjoy their horses. So we're all on the same side. It's just getting everybody to see it that way. That's a little hard. (laughs) And I think it's safe to assume there's a majority of people who want the best for the horse and care about welfare. And there's a couple bad apples in any discipline, any time who tend to get most of the attention at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think it's how each respective sport reacts to those bad apples that really should be what people see and judge by. Mm -hmm. Of course, I say that and racing has not always necessarily done the best job of that either so yeah. you know <laughs> well yeah. not a lot of the disciplines haven't been that way <laughs> yeah well yeah. i'm it's, hoping that you'll have some good news to write about soon natalie and not just <laughs> you know more of more of the bad investigative journalism that yeah i'm yeah, sure is very good there's, always, there's always good news out there you know i think that you make a difference by shining light on things that are dark and unpleasant so You're unfortunately right. i probably have to keep going on that side of things because i really believe that's where i'm gonna make things better that's what i keep telling myself anyway and you are i firmly believe that the work that you're doing and and this is how we get the word out and this is how you start to make change so i think you are doing fabulous work over at pollock report if people want to read this particular series how can they find it easily probably the best thing to do is to go to our website, our homepage, pollockreport.com, and we've got a search option on every page, and you can use that search bar to look for Racing's Next Generation, and I think that probably isn't a uh, perfect search term, but it should bring you up one, at least one of the uh, pieces in the series, and then all the other parts are linked at the intro and the conclusion of each so that you can find them all easily. Awesome. So highly recommended for anybody, whether you're in aftercare, equestrian, or in the racing industry. If you've not already read this series, like absolutely put that on your must-read list and and get to it. So Natalie, thank you so much for coming on. I think we could go on and on for hours and hopefully by the end of it, fix all of the world's problems, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. So but we would love to have you come on again sometime, but thank you so much. Give Blueberry a big old hug and kiss from all of us at Retired Racehorse Radio and the RRP because he's a superstar too. (laughs) Absolutely. I will do that. Thank you so much for having me back. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. 
Spring is here and it's time to get organized. Cashflow Company has everything you need to get your barn, tack room, and trailer spick and span before show season begins. From stall organizers, gear bags, hooks, brushes, and everything in between, Cashflow Company's got your back for your pre-show season organizing needs. To stay up to date with the latest products and news, follow Cashflow Company on Facebook and Instagram. And to find their products, visit an authorized dealer or visit cashflowcompany.com. I'm super stoked. We are having another segment of our Making the Makeover series. If you listened to our last episode, you'll know that we changed up the Spotlight Rider series where we're now going to be featuring four distinctive riders over the whole course of their makeover journey. And we have our second one joining us today. Her name is Natalie Holdren. And we're super stoked to learn about her as well as her makeover course. So welcome to the show, Natalie. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so excited because you are a junior coming into the makeover. Is this your very first time or second? This is my second time in the makeover. My first time was last year at the mega makeover. So I'm excited to see kind of what a normal makeover year looks like. Mm-hmm. You and me both, my friend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you came into a very interesting year, probably very, well, maybe not very, but overwhelming to some degree with the amount of horses and people. So it's a little more chill, a little bit more planning ahead. Tell us a little bit about the horse that you're going to be bringing in? Yes. So uh, we have, his name is Temple Four, was his jockey club name. We call him Tempe around the barn. We acquired him through Mid-Atlantic Horse Rescue, which is where we've gotten most of our thoroughbreds from. His racing career had ended around August of 2020 because he unfortunately bowed his tendon on the track. So he went through the whole rehab process with um, Bev and now that his tendon was all better, Bev wanted to make sure he went to a good home. And so Bev had given us many horses before and knew how well we took care of our horses and everything of that nature. So that's kind of how we got him and a little bit about him and his backstory. I love it. And Tempe such a great name. I think that's so fun. And he's a yes, beautiful I'll, gray. <laughs> yes, yes. Big dapple gray. I love how... Uh, gigantic he is. I've always been one for the big, gigantic thoroughbreds. So I'm very excited. I love and Beth it. does such a good job down there at Mid-Atlantic Horse Rescue. So, you know, if you got a rehab from Bev, she's going to tell you exactly everything that horse needs. So mm-hmm. does he have any limitations or is he good to go for a second career? No, he is all good to go for a second career. Bev has no concerns about any limitations with him. Bev has always been very good with us about outlining those limitations. Our last, our makeover horse last year, she made sure she outlined that she would probably only do two six. And she's always made that very clear. And she was very clear that unless something happens down the road, there's no limitations for him. So we'll see where we go. Awesome. That's definitely cool. And you've been riding since you're the age of three. So you've had a very long riding career. When did your love of thoroughbred start? And when did you know you wanted to enter the makeover? Like, what was that spark? So um, Chrissy, who, um, Chrissy Aguilar, who owns all of uh, the horses, she owns Tempe and who I lease him through. She has always had lots of thoroughbred. She's always been in the thoroughbred industry and she's kind of gotten me started in horses. And up um, around when COVID was first starting, I started riding our makeover horse that was supposed to be for 2020. That's really when my love of thoroughbreds had started, but I'd been around her barn of thoroughbreds and I she'd gone to the makeover my horse, Zinzi Blanca, who I showed last year, was a 2019 makeover horse that she took. And she'd always come back with the coolest stories, the coolest videos. And I've always wanted to go to the horse park. And I've watched so many of my riding idols just grow up in the horse park and show there that it was something I knew I wanted to do. And so once I kind of really started riding the law and Getting into that portion, I really fell in love with the thoroughbreds and the industry behind them and just the process of being able to say, like, yes, this is my horse. I made this horse. I didn't just bring a horse in from another country that's already been started. Everything in this horse is fit to me, how I want, how they fit my riding and everything of that sort. And so the makeover I love too because it's just thoroughbreds. It's for those people who have restarted thoroughbreds. They all understand the process, like the struggles that some of us have to go through, like the highs, the lows, they understand everything, which is definitely, it makes everyone feel welcome. It's a big, great, like that's what probably my favorite part about the makeover was. 
Oh man, that's got to make you feel good, Kristen, being a part yeah. of the RRP. <laughs> well, this it is why we, yeah, this is why it gets me out of bed in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's certainly amazing. And I agree. The The makeover is such a community builder. It's such a cool space to be in. It's not like any other horse show, in my opinion. Did you get to meet any of like the trainers you look up to while you were there? Did you have a chance to fangirl over anyone there? I look up to a lot of the girls who ride for our Mid-Atlantic team. Specifically, Ginny Cole brought her mare. Her bar name is Faith. I'm blanking on what her jockey club name was, but she was the first Mid-Atlantic horse to go to eventing. And Ginny's position, the way she rides, how gentle she rides, but still being firm was something that I've always wanted in my riding and that I'm still working towards in my riding. So, And I've been able to sit in, in a few of like her lessons, watching her at our local eventing series going, but be able to see her in action at the makeover. And we watched, we were actually have finally were done showing when she was showing for the eventing portion. So we got to watch her show jumping and her cross country course. And that was, so cool to see me because we had all seen faith at square one to, so to see her at that finish line at RRP was definitely incredible. And just being able to watch like Ginny, who I've watched for so long, definitely was something that I enjoyed a lot. I love that. That's mm-hmm. so cool. And that mid Atlantic team, everyone runs so tight down there, which I love, you know, I really like that. It's become something that all the mid Atlantic folks do like a, a big goal for everybody. So now are you entered as a team or as an individual? So yes, we are a team. It's me. And then one other girl, um, Alyssa Kelly from our barn, she rode one of our other make over horses at Peyton place last year and seeing how well Peyton come out. I'm very excited to have her on the team this year. And she has a few other horses from Bohemia that we're bringing along as well to come to the makeover. So it's us two, but yes, we are signed up as a team. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. So for any listeners who are not sure how the team format works, a team is so that somebody like Natalie and her barn, they can all join together in the process of bringing a makeover horse along. And then at the makeover, various parts of the team show in different segments of the competition. So maybe you guys will swap out, you know, and each ride a hunter round or each ride a dressage test or whatever discipline. What disciplines are you guys pointing to right now? Do you have anything in mind? Definitely show hunters is something that we're aiming to. Um, We were a little weary about that at first when we were just starting off. We weren't really sure what direction we wanted to head into, but he's definitely picked up jumping and that's definitely one of his favorite things to do. So we're definitely hoping for show hunters and we do like, dressage we have done that in the makeover in the past and Alyssa has started taking her dressage lessons on him and I do a little venting local venting series around us so I think we're kind of going to see how he does with these next few venting shows we're going to try to go to some of the tip dressage shows with last year's makeover horse and we'll probably drag Tempe along since there's an extra trailer spot and so probably show hunters and dressage but we definitely, we've also had horses who have done competitive trail and we love that as well. So definitely a few options. Yeah. You guys love it all. You guys are just, <laughs> you're very versatile there. Natalie, I know we're running out of time. What do you have coming up? Any events for Tempe that we should be keeping an eye on? And also I need to ask you, how are you planning to keep him nice and clean over show season? I need to know your grooming uh, techniques. So right now, because it is pretty muddy here in Delaware, um, just making sure that I bought hands-on grooming gloves and those are his absolute oh, favorite oh, things. Those are good ones. <laughs> all the time. And then for Christmas, I got a Haas shimmel brush, which is magic. It takes all the stains out. I don't know how they do it, what magic they put in this brush, but it works magic because his legs are still super dark. So they don't stain right now, but his face is getting lighter by the minute. So oh, all no. the stains are on his face. So <laughs> and thank goodness he's a good boy and lets me brush his face. But that is that and lots of Quicksilver. I'm going to have to invest in a half a gallon of Quicksilver. I'm having a feeling. Well, hopefully he stays dark for you up until the makeover. Then he can lighten up after. <laughs> yeah, that's the hope, but you never yeah. know. But, well, do, uh, do you have any horse shows or clinics coming up? Yes. So we are planning on April through October, right up to the makeover. We do a local show series called uh, the Chesapeake Bay Horse Show Association. 
mm-hmm. and they actually just became tip affiliated this year. So we're oh, going to definitely do their thoroughbred. They're definitely going to do their thoroughbred hunter division. We've done that with all of our horses, and then I'm going to be doing their junior X division, which is their two six X division. Um, just trying that out to make sure he gets regulated with that two six height um, enough, and being able to in case we want to do like more hunter derby, see if that's our C the Eck rounds kind of tend to ride like some jump around just to kind of see if we want to go the hunter or the jumper or Eck after the makeover. And then I know May 22nd, mid Atlantic has their all thoroughbred benefit show that all the proceeds go to mid Atlantic. So we're definitely going to do that. And they have a hunter derby there. So we're definitely going to try to see if we can get ourselves ready for that hunter derby, but lots and lots of shows coming up and hopefully some cross country schoolings in the near future as well. Beautiful. You go girl. You've got a full calendar, but that's perfect. Always that's exactly busy. what these horses need to get ready for the makeover. So you are right on track. So we're going to be sure to keep in touch with you, Natalie, as you continue to prepare and we have your Facebook on for our show notes. And I believe you have an Instagram too, correct? Yes. Awesome. So we'll link both of those. If anyone wants to follow Natalie's journey, there's so much to be held for both of you and Tempe. We're so excited to see it. And then we'll be checking in monthly to see how you're going and how you're getting a little bit step closer each time you get to the makeover. Yes. Thank you. I'm very excited. Yeah. We can't wait to cheer you on. So best Mm -hmm. of luck in your upcoming shows this month. And we'll look forward to getting the report next time. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Joy and Kristen, this is Lee. I just wanted to um, take a moment to congratulate you all on 100 episodes. It's always a great week when a new episode is released, and I don't really have a favorite because I think they're all fabulous. Um, But I always learn a new trick or a bit of information from each episode that inspires me to keep trucking away with Finn on our journey. And it's always great to know that there's a supportive community for other thoroughbred lovers out there. And you two do such a great job of fostering that. So thank you both for what you do. And Finn and I wish you a hundred more episodes. Take care. Hey guys, it's Colleen Nolan Tran. And I just wanted to call and say congratulations on reaching your country's episode. Personally, one of my favorite episodes was this year's Starbred Makeover episode because it really captured the spirit of the makeover. And on a personal note, my interview with Joy was the only thing keeping me sane before I wrote in the finale. But it's too vain to pick my own interview as a favorite, and as an owner of several quote-unquote limited horses, I also really love the limited horse panel. So, congrats on your 100th episode, and here's to 100 more. Well, Kristen, this has been an epic, memorable episode so far, but of course it would not be an episode of Retired Racehorse Radio without new vocations joining us. And today we are joined by Winnie Morgan Nemeth, who runs the standard bread side of things, if you're new here. Welcome back, Whitney. Thank you for having me and congrats on your 100th episode. Thank you so much. It's so amazing that New Vocations has been with us since the very first episode. They were a very big part of collaborating with us. And we thank you so much for the partnership. And we love that you've joined our family here and like having you every month. Yes. We're happy, you know, to promote retired racehorses any way we can. And your show is just amazing. Oh, we can't do it without you though. Absolutely. But (laughs) that's enough gushing. This whole episode's about gushing today. and I love it. (laughs) But I know Kristen has a great question for you. Yeah. And this is why we're so excited to have, you know, the standard bread representation now on retired racehorse radio. So I have been trying to get my standard bread, uh, legged up again for the spring. It's been a challenge with our weather. Um, and he is raring to go this spring, even though he's 19. Uh, and it made me curious as to how standard breads are conditioned on the track or, you know, what kind of endurance is just sort of like inherent to the breed because he feels like he's ready to go trot 12 miles down the road again. Again, even though I know he isn't because he's been standing around all winter, but he feels awesome. Um, right. And that seems to be common with standard breads. So like what, you know, how does it work? Is it conditioned into them or is it bred into them? Or is it some combination of both? Um, actually, it's it's a lot of both. Um, I think starting by just looking at the breed as a whole, they're extremely hardy, tough <laughs> breeds in terms yeah. of just, they're not sensitive to things like the thoroughbred counterpart can be, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but within standard breads, they're um, usually picked out as yearlings. 
And then they go right into training late in their yearling year. So they'll be broke the harness um, by that January 1st of their two-year-old year. And a lot of them head to Florida with the warm weather, um, which is nice for conditioning them and getting them ready. But when they are broke, they will, you know, be trained or jogged, we'll say, um, six six days a week. They usually get one day off. Um, oh, wow. So they are in a very professional, very professional program um, as a trainer. You know, to have a racehorse in training is a lot of dollars per day. And they get incredible training. So most of them on average, I would say, you know, some trainers a little bit different, but would be going about four to five miles a day, you know, working up to that. And then they can race once a week. So once, um, you know, once they're ready, you know, they're broke and, you know, two, three-year-olds obviously aren't racing every week, but our aged horses um, can certainly race every week. And so to have a horse that has been in a training program, which most have since they were two, and then they retire to me, you know, say like the horse we're going to talk about here soon at 13 years old, that's a lot of miles and miles yeah, it is. and miles. And for that reason is why, you know, they have a hard time uh, learning to canter because if you've done that for right. the past <laughs> you know, 11 years and you know your routine really well and you know you're off on Sunday and then you're back again on Monday and you know what you're doing and, you know, you're jogging or you might, you know, really go once a week where you're really getting trained, um, you know, like race race ready. So um, they learn real fast, you know, that routine. And the very nice thing about standard res is exactly what you're seeing with your horse is that you can kind of give them a break um, and they are exactly how they were when you left off. And a lot of breeds are not like that. Um, right. yeah, where my you're seeing, are not like that for sure. No, <laughs> no. You're seeing, your horse is like, okay, let's go. What are we doing today? And he's 19 years old and you think he can go 12 miles. Like, you know, he might be able to, you're not going to. Um, I'm certainly not going to do it to him, but. <laughs> right. But that is what they are known for. And that's one reason why people just love them, you know, especially just your average horse owner that, you know, maybe they ride during the summer and then they give their horse, you know, the winter off and then they come back and he's like exactly the same horse as he was before. So it's just, you know, one of the qualities that makes them so incredible, but, you know, they're bred to be able to do the miles and pound the track, you know, like we've talked about before, it's a harder track than what a thoroughbred goes on because they're pulling a race bike. So that's a little bit different. And they, they work a lot of different muscles for that versus, you know, being a riding horse. It's such a testament too, to their soundness, you know, that they can go that many miles and then still have so much to give, you know, in a second career at age 19 at age, you know, whatever, like this is really, really cool. And I know we've said it before, but like, it just really hits home with that many miles a week. Yes. Yeah, it, it really, really does. And, um, you know, again, it, it's the reason why the breed is used by the Amish uh, as their mode of transportation, because they're sturdy horses. Yeah, for sure. So <laughs> speaking of my little horse, uh, the horse that you sent us for this week reminds me so much of Wes and his face. I love this horse. Tell us a little bit more about Latest Desire. Latest Desire um, came to us. He's a war horse. He is 13 years old and he raced 251 times. He uh, was a claimer. So he was, you know, exchanged hands a couple times, but I have had uh, probably four of his trainers reach out to me just to let me know what an amazing horse he was and how great, you know, he was on the track and how thrilled they are that we now have him to, you know, get him on to, to his next endeavor. So that says a lot to me uh, when people reach out to me like that. I know our trainer, Bridget, just loves him. He really wants to be a show horse. And um, if the weather cooperates this week, we're going to show him off in dressage tack because she's taught him to canter. So he walked out in canters um, and he loves to be pampered and he likes to go outside, but he likes to stall. He likes to come in. He's fine with other horses. Um but he looks more like a, a show horse, whether that be like more dressage or even maybe a saddle seat type horse. I don't know. But we're going to show him off as a dressage horse this week and that and then get that posted because he is he's fancy. 
Oh, he's so cute. He just, he has a, a very similar facial expression to my horse. And I see that they both share Western Hanover in the pedigree. Now okay. I'm not super familiar with standard bred lines. So where does the Western Hanover come in for this horse? Um, and on his damn side. Okay. Yeah. They just, I'm going to have to send you a side by side, but yeah, if you guys are looking for your own Wes, don't pass this guy up. He is super cute. Joy, what do you think of him? I really like, I just can't get over his tail photos. Like this is a horse who knows that he looks good. He oh, yeah. knows that he, yeah. like he could easily own an arena if he walked into it. Like, he's just full of flair and personality. And that's what I'm picking up from his photo. Yeah. So yes, I could easily yeah. see him going into dressage. And while he would be traditional, I could also see him having some fun in a hunt class as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Just with the persona he has and like, don't be afraid that he's not a warm wood, everyone. He definitely has a presence of one and his gates look super lovely. I will say I really enjoy the descriptions of him. Like the fact that you're you? like D is short for diva, um, <laughs> which I yeah. will tell everyone. So my horse was on her new vocations page. She was actually called Barbie diva. Like she was the same thing. Had a lot of personality, would definitely tell you when she liked something, when she didn't like something, but she is like a barn favorite at my barn. Everyone loves her. She's such a ham. She's so funny. The kids love her. So don't let the diva make you nervous either because I'm personally attracted to that. And this guy is on his way to cantering. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Just ready to go, folks. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Well, he's definitely, he is definitely that. The D is, is for diva and... He's just had the best care his entire life. Obviously, he's he was still going and just, you know, retired from racing maybe just a few months ago. So, but he's very kind and has a lot of personality and just a lot of fun. We're, we are so excited to have him. And the adoption fee is $2,000 now discounted to $1,500. So that's a bargain, folks. Get that yes. application in and get ready to bring home latest desire. I love him. And I will say he's also very smooth to ride. So not all of them are very smooth, but he is oh, very smooth. Plus, 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 mm. plus, plus. Those are all the green flags. <laughs> Go ahead, check him out on horseadoption.com as well as all the other horses. And, you know, should he be adopted by the time you're listening in, get your application. And if you're interested, there are plenty of horses and Winnie and Leandra will be more than happy to help match you. Yes, we will. Thanks very much, Winnie. Thank you. Thanks, Winnie. Well, this has been a super fun look back for us, um, you know, and a review of our favorite moments and, you know, shouting out to listeners. It's been a really, really cool episode. So we hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll be back with our quote unquote regular content again uh, next month. So before we close the show, there's one more person who really deserves a shout out because Mm -hmm. while Joy and I are sitting here chatting away, talking to all these cool guests, there is a man listening to us and jotting down every time we screw up. And his name is George and he's our producer and he's awesome. Hi, George. I know you're listening. I know you can hear me. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Hi, everyone. And thank you so much. That is insanely kind of you to say. Sorry to break the producer wall here, but I just had to after such a warm compliment. Thank you so much. It is an absolute honor to work on the show with you guys. Yes, George, like, you may think Krista and I are the masterminds here, but like George is really the ringleader of this crazy he keeps us on task. <laughs> he edits out every time we screw up or swear. I have a feeling he's jotting it all down and it's going to come back to Hana someday in like an we epic blooper hope. episode, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Maybe. look, it we'll is a out. team effort and that team is Flintstone Media. Thank you. So- no, I'm kidding. But it is a team <laughs> effort. True. We all it's, get it it's done true. together. <laughs> Yes, Flintstone <laughs> Media and especially George has been a huge part of the success of the show because without them, um, you'd have to rely on us to edit it. And I will tell you, Chris and I are not editors and this show would not be good. Nope, we're just talkers. We're just, we're just talkers. That's all we're good at. That and playing with horses. So George, thank you so much for being a part of this, for probably not really understanding anything we're saying half the time, but just going along with it. And uh for cleaning up all our mistakes and making us look somewhat professional on the show. Yeah. Thank you, George. Y'all are making me blush. It's a pleasure. (laughs) Thank you for having me. You can find our show notes and links to today's guests on the website at retiredracehorseradio.com. Like us on Facebook and Instagram, just search for retired racehorse radio. 
follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. You can find me on Instagram at The Horseback Writer and on Twitter at Kristen Kovach. My email is kbentley at the rrp.org. You can find me on Instagram at misfitmare and my email is joy at horseradionetwork.com. I mean it, guys. Like DM us, email us, any suggestions, ideas, things you want to hear about. We want to hear it. Um, if you have complaints, though, send them to, to Jennifer at horseradionetwork.com. That's where those go. Uh, thank you so much to our sponsors, Kentucky Performance Products and Cashflow Company and our partners, New Vocations Adoption Program and the Retired Resource Project. Don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network, part of Equine Network at horseradionetwork.com. Remember to set your goals high and love to learn from every ride. And add more leg. Cheers, everyone. Here's to 100 more. Here's to 100 more.